Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Kovitz. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 30. And uh, we should be finishing it up today. And then we only have one more chapter to go in Proverbs. But today we're going to be speaking about four graceful things. Or four things that are beautiful and going. The way they move. The way they, uh, they are in action. Father, Lord, please bless your word. I pray, God, you speak through me. I pray, Lord, that I would be a blessing to the hearer and that I would properly represent your word. In Jesus' name, amen. There be three things which go well, yea, four are comely in going. And that word comely means beautiful, beautiful. You know, let's go to Isaiah 50, 53 real quick and uh, verse number two. Uh, we can start in verse one. Here Isaiah prophesies of the coming Messiah. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. You see how the Bible... It's just neat. I'm just seeing it there, how it defines itself, how it's got a built-in dictionary. So he says, the Bible says he hath no form nor comeliness. What does that mean? Read on. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, we live in a society where everything's about looks, you know, sex sells and you know, everybody wants a beautiful house. Everybody wants the most beautiful car. Everybody wants, you know, include myself. I got the nice looking car there, you know. But it's all about our image. It's 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 how we look. It's, uh, you know, we're really concerned about going out in public and, and not looking neat, not looking good, looking uh, clean, looking or smelling clean. You know, we we ought to be that way. I don't think Christians ought to be slobs, but we ought not to be overly focused on the outward appearance, on others or ourselves. Yes, we ought to be clean. We ought to be neat. Yes, we ought to comb our hair. Yes, we ought to brush our teeth. But it's not all about the exterior. You know, we see the Old Testament and, and uh, it's, it's largely about the exterior. And Jesus, when he came to the Pharisees, the religious crowd, he rebuked them concerning the cleaning of the outside of the cup but on the inside there's it's dirty the cup is dirty uh they're like whited sepulchers a sepulcher is uh like a gravestone but inside they're full of dead man's bones so they were concerned about cleaning themselves up i got this little mustache hair that just keeps wanting to curl into my mouth here it's driving me nuts. <laughs> it didn't do it earlier in the day, but it does it right when I'm preaching because that's the way it is, you know. The flesh, it just wars against the spirit. So before I get distracted, the, the Pharisees were very overly concerned about the outward appearance. And somewhat rightfully so, somewhat, I say, because... The Old Testament was about the out, outward. I mean, even the signs were all outward. Um, so much of it was was exterior. But if their hearts were ready, they would be ready to transition into something different where the concentration is on the, on the heart more so than the exterior. You know, that, that sounds good, but I, I want to... I want to correct that because it, God's always been about the heart. God's never been about the exterior. He wants us to have a, a, a good exterior only so much as being a good testimony of, of, of God in our life. You know, we ought to care enough about our appearance that we are approachable. You know, if you're unapproachable... And that can, you know, you could be unapproachable because you don't take care of yourself, but you could be unapproachable because you overly take care of yourself. And people feel like, wow, I'm just beneath you. I, I'm, I'm intimidated by you. And we ought to, 
put some emphasis on, on the exterior. And the Bible even says bodily exercise profit if little. But what's the most important thing? It's the spirit of man. It's the deepest part of man. And we don't want to be guilty of cleaning on the outside of the cup and leaving ourselves dirty on the inside. But Jesus, he was, he was not beautiful as you would have, you would assume. You would assume God come in the flesh would be the most handsome. But he didn't come here in that fashion. He came as a servant. He didn't want people following him because of how handsome he was. He wanted them to follow him because of the words that he would speak. He said that he said whatever the father told him to say. And uh, you know what? But there's no comeliness, no beauty. So I just thought we'd turn there real quick and look at that. And here are three things which go well. Yea, four are comely and going. Checking the audio on that. Hopefully it doesn't... Uh, peak on that I know the cracking of a can can be quite loud to to a microphone <laughs> a lion which is strongest among beasts a lion so the first example that agar agar the son of jacob gives concerning a graceful thing is a lion a lion which is strongest among beasts. The lion is said to be the king of the forest. If I were the king of the forest. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sometimes things go in my head and then it just comes out of the mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And the multitude of words there want of not sin. You know, I don't want to goof around too much, but... I also want to be me, and I uh, want to have that sense of humor in there. And we just seen that recently, my brother and I. <laughs> With a cowardly lion, we were watching The Wizard of Oz. And, and that cowardly lion, what did he need more than anything? He needed courage. And it's funny because when he first appears on the scene, and I didn't think I'd talk about this, but he puts on a show as if he has courage. He acts real tough, doesn't he? He jumps out and he starts, rum, rum, and he starts, rum, rum, he's like, put him up, put him up. And he starts doing all this as a show. But you know, sometimes there's a lot of people in the world that try to present themselves as being strong. They try to intimidate you, but that is only evidence that they are not strong, that they are actually fake. They are putting on a mask. They're trying to compensate for a lack of courage they're trying to compensate for a lack of confidence hmm. the lion does not have to concentrate on being fearsome he, he is fearsome the lion doesn't have to try to be ferocious he is ferocious whether he roars or he lays down people know don't approach that lion be careful it, it'll tear you up Unless you're that man, uh, I forget his name, Dean Schneider, I think. <laughs> Been watching some clips of that, too. And it's kind of a blessing, you know. He raised these lions when they were little. Excuse me. He raised these lions since they were little. And they're out, you know. Uh, I think they're sometimes caged up, but I think sometimes they're in a bigger open reserve. And uh, he goes out there, and they run up to him. And normally, you, if you've seen something like that, it's going to be a massacre. Some lion runs up on a man. But they run up on him, and they jump on him, leap on him, and they fall on the ground together and, and then start cuddling. He cuddles these lions. I mean, the females and the males with the big old manes, and and he'll lay down with them. I mean, <laughs> reminds me of uh, Daniel in the lion's den. You know what? But it's amazing that the Bible even says that all manner of beasts have been tamed or can be tamed you know but the mouth can no man tame and uh normally i would be really nervous for a person that that animal may turn on you and uh kill you but i, I don't think that's going to be the case with this guy these uh these animals they've known him since since they were little and uh he's a part of their 
their pack, you know, if, if that's what they call it. They're a lion's, uh, what do they call that? Oh, can you hear all that residual noise? Oh, they got the leaf blower out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leaf Blower Man. A lion, which is strongest among beasts. So I'm like losing my place here. The, the lion is strongest among beasts. He doesn't have to try even to be strong. He is strong. And I just preached about four little wise things in the last message in Proverbs. And I, I, I titled it, The Church. Weak yet wise, I believe that's a, a people weak yet wise. But now I'm going to talk about a strong people. We are to be strong. We are to be weak in, in a in, in a manner of uh, sort of like a timidness, a gentleness. That's a better word for it. it there's no brownie points for being timid. Some people that's just their personality. But I'm talking about. We ought to have a, an approachable exterior. But deep down in the spirit, we need to be strong. We need to be strong like a lion. Why? For the spiritual warfare that we are to encounter in this Christian life. And if you would be weak spiritually, you will be offended. You will be offended easily. When, when, when an evil satanic spirit attacks you you're going to be timid you're going to be afraid you're going to back down and and we need to be strong we need to be strong like lions strong i'm not talking about the exterior i'm talking about inside the heart of a lion in the deepest part of us we need to be strong christians take a strong stance I have a strong stance on the Word of God, and I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, and I am not going to compromise that for you or anybody. And, and you know what? We have to stand firm. We The lion doesn't give up ground. The lion takes ground. The, the lion is not going to fear when he's approached. You know what? And the devil is going to come to us, sometimes in the form of a person. And we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not to attack people. But we also have to understand that people can be taken captive by Satan at his will if they are unsaved. If they are unsaved, the devil can take total control of them. Now, we don't attack the person that the devil might be manipulating. We have to realize that it's a spiritual principality and power at work. Pray for that individual. But don't be intimidated by a person, even a demon-possessed person. We have to be bold enough to be there and, and to help them. Uh, to do whatever it is that the Spirit of God leads us to do concerning them. And uh, the lion is strongest among the beasts. We need to be strong and we need to pray that God strengthens us after the inner man. Because if you're not strong in the inner man, you're going to cower when, when, when you get attacked. And if you're in the ministry, if you're serving God, if you love God, you will be attacked. There's no, there's no if. It's just a matter of when. And the devil is going to draw up his plans against you. And the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's not a roaring lion. But he walks around as one. And a Christian needs to do the same walk as lions because we need to combat a lion and you know what 
a sheep a sheep is not going to be able to fight spiritual warfare we are likened to sheep and my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me you know and we do follow the lord and we got to be humble as my grandpa would say like a lamp <laughs> not a lamb but he would call it a lamp <laughs> But everything in the Christian life is balance. If you're nothing but a lamb, you're in the ditch on the left. If you're nothing but a lion in all aspects, including exterior, I'm talking about interior, but if you're if you're so aggressive you can't even be reasoned with, then you're in the ditch on the right. So humble on the outside, strong in spirit like a lion, and bold as a lion. When we preach the gospel, we need not fear. If you will open your mouth, God will give you boldness. If you will pray for God to fill you with the spirit, he will fill you. And I've encountered many aggressive people that tried to shut me down or tried to intimidate me. And I was not intimidated because the boldness of a lion was in me and the lion of the tribe of Judah lives in me Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah he's not walking around as a lion he is a lion but what is also Jesus he is a lamb I just thought of that right now he's a lamb but when he comes back he comes back as a lion and you know what Jesus is he's a perfect balance between lamb and lion you know what we are to be? The perfect balance between lamb and lion. The Bible creates that balance. If you don't read this Bible, if you're not in this Bible, if you don't know what it has to say, you're going to get out of balance somewhere. You know, I was speaking about that in my local church about judging people. You know, you can go so far with judgment where you become a busybody and you're in the ditch on the right. And you're playing the Holy Spirit to the sense where you're just nosy and you're just, uh, you're not really even got time to, to clean your own life, but you just want to go around cleaning everybody else's. But then the other opposite end of that spectrum is to say we're not to judge nothing or anybody. And that's the Holy Spirit's job. Well, it, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not just floating around convicting people of sin. He uses us to preach the truth and and to convict men of sin, whether saved or lost. If you don't speak up, that person's not going to get help. They can get help from from the Holy Spirit if they have the Holy Spirit. But sometimes you can't see, you can't see your own sin and, and it takes somebody to bring it up. For example, Nathan goes to, to David and gives that illustration about uh, the man that had all these lambs, but then he took the one man's lamb. And then he said, thou art the man, when David got all frustrated and mad and said that man ought to be put to death for that. Well, you have many wives, and then you went and took somebody else's wife. And you could say, well, and you know, David said take not thy holy spirit from me you know he had the holy spirit upon him well why didn't the holy spirit tell him maybe he was trying to tell him but sometimes this the holy spirit needs a voice sometimes the holy spirit needs a preacher you know it'd be really silly for us to believe that i'm talking about being out of balance to the left that we're not to judge one another or that we're not to correct one another then what are we doing going to church I'll just sit on the couch and the Holy Spirit will, will make me the way he wants to, me to be, the, the Christian he wants me to be. I'll be like Christ sitting on the couch eating Doritos. Why even listen to the sermon? Why read the Bible? You know, and, and there's also a false balance when you get into a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I was talking about this with Brother uh, Tommy and then I also talked about it with uh, Brother Matt. And if you only present the new creature and you don't present the other side of that, that is in my flesh, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present, but how to do it? Paul had a flesh still. 
And he said, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I want, don't want to do, that's what I do. And if you're only presenting one side of that and saying you're a new creature as if there's no old man existing. And I know our old man was crucified with Christ, but you have to reckon that. You have to understand that in order for you to live victoriously. You have to apply that. You can't just say, oh, my old man's dead and I'm a new creature. And therefore, it's as if you never sin. Well, if you're... So, so there's a balance. You see what I'm saying? Yes, we are a new creature, but there's still the old man there. And we are to live in the spirit, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then what's this? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I thought I'm a new creature. Well, the flesh is still there. Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Why even say that, Paul? Why even mention that? I'm a new creature. I don't I don't need to hear that. I do everything that pleases the Father. Not so. If you walk in the spirit, you will. But the flesh is still there. So you see there's there's balance there. And I got way off uh on that and I never expected to do that, but That's okay. A lion which is strongest among beasts. Let's look at Isaiah 53:12. Isaiah 53 12 uh, let's go back just a little bit further talking about Jesus let's look at verse 10 uh, let's look at verse 9 and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death who's that that's Jesus because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand he shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities I drink these things and they're all carbonated and you've heard it before and then I sit there and burp the whole time. <laughs> Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So let's look at this. I underline therefore or let's first look at verse 12 here therefore will i divide him a portion with the great god the father will divide a portion with the great to his son and he is the ultimate of all greatness he will rule and reign on this earth but then he is not going to rule and reign alone he is going to have his saints that suffered with him to reign also with him and he shall divide the spoil with the meek, with the with the weak. The meek shall inherit the earth. So yes, they are a part of that because that's the balance. It doesn't say that here, but here's the emphasis is on the strong. He divides the spoil with the strong. And a strong person is meek. A strong person doesn't have to show his strength. Moses was the meekest man that that probably ever lived in the Bible. And when Aaron and uh, his sister were making fun of his wife for being so black, or his brother Phil Kidd would say, I mean black. She was black. <laughs> well, you know what? He Instead of being so offended that he prayed judgment down on his brother and sister, or or say I'm the man of God how dare you speak about the man of God or God speaks face to face to me who do you think you are you know what he was quiet but you know who did say that kind of thing God did God said I spoke him to, to Moses face to face like who are you to speak about my servant like this but he was meek he had strength, but he controlled his strength. 
he didn't just outpour wrath on everybody. He was like a lamb, but he was also strong like a lion. And, you know, I, I also think of Joshua and Caleb. They were a different breed. All of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt that were above 20 years old, God held accountable for their unbelief as far as going into the Canaan land and conquering the foes and taking the land. Because their heart of unbelief, it it prevented them. God says you are cursed to wander for 40 years until you pass away and all die. But there were two that had a positive report. Two that were strong. Two that were allowed in. To, that they survived as all the rest of the generation passed. That was Joshua and that was Caleb. And, and they led battles. And God went before them. And they conquered foes, many kings in Canaan land. And then even in his old age, Caleb said, I want that mountain. And you know what? I believe there was giants there still. And he, he already known of a victory where they, they defeated giants. And he wasn't afraid. And even in his old age, he still had the strength of his youth. He was still strong. And this is the type of person that God will divide the spoil with. What kind of spoil did the carnal Christian, the unbelieving, uh, weak spirit, weak spirited Christians, the Christian that were, was soulish and, 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 and lived by his emotions, if he got shook up, he let it dictate his whole life and, and, and his action. He could not even have a will to serve God because he was afraid only the strong only the strong were strong I'm talking strong inwardly strong in spirit they went with God in the battle they defeated the foes and then in the book of Joshua we've been going over it there was uh, the land that was divided to the 12 tribes excuse me a two and a half of them were mildly strong but they didn't cross over they crossed over to fight but they wanted an inheritance that was on the other side of Jordan but they got that because you know what they were strong maybe not as strong as they ought to be but they were strong enough to go forward and, and fight with their brethren and we're not all the strongest but some of us, you know what? We can help one another out. We can fight some of these spiritual battles. We can serve God with one another. And I'm telling you, if you will be strong in spirit, and, and, and when you're persecuted, you're not so quickly offended. You don't give up. You don't just say, well, I'm throwing in the towel because I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Well, I didn't know they were going to make fun of me. Well, I didn't know that they were going to try to even kill me. But if you're strong spiritually, you will. And if you suffer with Christ, because he was strong, if you suffer with Christ in like manner, you will, he will divide the spoil with you, with the strong. And the perfect illustration of that is you can be saved as the children of Israel, a generation that was weak though in their spirit, and they died in a wilderness they were supposed to get an inheritance and this is that half of the inheritance that I speak of often that people misunderstand they think that oftentimes people think that we all inherit equally we all do inherit a glorified body no matter what if you're saved you, you are going to get that body you have the earnest of the spirit and there the bible calls this the adoption of sons where you will receive that body if you're saved but if you're saved and you walk after the flesh your whole life if you're saved and you won't speak up for god on the job if you're saved and, and you're ashamed of him if you're saved and you're weak in your spirit and you will not do spiritual exercise read the bible pray go to church you won't serve god then you will, as illustrated by the, the carnal children of Israel that first left Egypt, you will die missing that inheritance. It was for you. 
but you lost it. And 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 there's there's everything is a balance. Everything in the Bible's a double-edged sword. There's an inheritance everybody gets, a glorified body, but there's an inheritance that only some get. Those that what? Poor what did he do? He poured this is why he gets the spoil. This is why he gets a portion with the great. Because he poured out his soul unto death. If you what should it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That applies to a Christian too. If a Christian will be soulish, if a Christian will only be driven by emotion, only driven by uh, the the desire to get intellectually smarter, but not apply that intellect for God or use it for God. If if a Christian is willed and, and has a strong will, but he's self willed, he didn't pour his soul out. He didn't pour his soul out unto death. We are to die daily, die to our own desire, our own passion our own lust, our own pursuit. I want to pursue money. I want to pursue fame. Go ahead. But you didn't pour your soul out. You could even be saved and you can start going that direction. But you're just going to wander in the wilderness and die and lose that other half of the inheritance of ruling and reigning. You will not be divided the spoil. Why? If you love your life, this is your soul life. This is your self-will. If you love your life, you will lose it. This is talking about being a disciple. This is beyond just being saved. If you love your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for Christ's sake, you will gain it. What? Not in this life, in the life to come. A greater quality of life will be had. You will be happy. You will be glad. If you seek all that here, you you get it here, but not so much there. There will be regret for those that are saved that live entirely after their own lust. Even any portion of us. So, you know what? We, we can be half-hearted for God, and we'll regret that. We will all wish that we would have been stronger in spirit and, and, and set out to serve him. He doesn't just divide the spoil with everybody. Is it, does it say that? He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he had poured out his soul into death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I tell you what, man, if you want to know what this Bible says, you have to study it. You have to compare scripture with scripture. Here a little, there a little. It's not all found in one spot. God is not going to reward those that are too lazy to study. You want understanding on some things that seem contradictory? It's written that way for a reason. God does not contradict himself, but you also have to see that there's often two sides to a coin. I mean, there always is two sides to a coin. I'm pretty sure, I mean, unless there were some coins that were in print that were blank on one side. But. Okay, let's go back to Proverbs here. Proverbs chapter number 30 and verse number 31. And we'll try to move on here from, from the lion. And the righteous, the Bible says, <laughs> I can't move on yet. The righteous are bold as lions. Amen. There's a place in, in this life for boldness. Sometimes there's a pl place for meekness too. We are to be balanced Christians and you only get it through reading this book consistently. Getting through the whole book, not just the parts you like. A greyhound. This is another thing that is comely and going. Man, my mouth is so dry. My lips are so dry. I keep licking my lips like Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> a greyhound. 
a greyhound is very fast. I think we all know that it's the fastest amongst dogs. I don't think I've ever seen a dog race that did not include a greyhound. They were not primarily greyhounds. They were entirely greyhounds as far as I've ever seen. No other dog is faster. And it's one of the uglier dogs. It's not really that good looking of a dog. Little skinny, narrow, long face. A body that's got that waist that's real small and and a big old chest excuse me big old chest kind of like me you know waist all small and big old chest (laughs) pastor was my pastor was uh talking about you know going to the gym and thinking that everybody you know you're to show all your muscles and he's like and if you do you're delusional because you know most of us we think we're strong or we're, we're real muscular and lean and all that but uh, sort of funny, you know, and, uh, you know, it kind of convicts me too, you know, but, uh, he was preaching later in the evening and then he mentioned how he got up early and he was riding his bike and then he was lifting weights and he started saying, Oh, can't you tell? And he started, you know, uh, and then I yelled out delusional and he's like, stay out of my preaching brother Josh. <laughs> you know, I love that. I love that. My pastor is not so man of godish that he can't even like you're not going to take this service from me like he knows that we're kidding around or we we have fun one with another and he doesn't take himself so seriously he's meek he's he's a humble man he's a good uh good leader i want to follow a guy like that i hope you got a good pastor like that it really helps you in this christian life a greyhound a greyhound got that big chest but streamline in the waist and, and muscular legs and all this and, and very lean. You know, if we want to run this Christian race, we need to set aside every weight and run the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith our of our faith. And this is a marathon race. And if you look at the marathon runners, they're not hugely muscular. They're very skinny. <laughs> Why? Because they lay aside a bunch of muscular weight as well, so that way, for sake of distance. But I wouldn't say that the Christian race is entirely a marathon. It's mostly a marathon, but there is some portion of, I think, sprinting to it. There is some portion where we ought to be haste. There, We ought not to lollygag. We ought not to take our time getting to something that needs to be done in a church and if the if we see something in the church if there's if there's trash on the ground you ought to not wait for somebody else to pick it up you ought to pick it up you know if there's something to be done then do it be quick to do it if somebody asks in the church you know what we need volunteers we need some people to help move some things or whatever it is don't well just slowly sluggishly oh maybe well i kind of got to go home uh, you know no be quick be quick to volunteer be quick like a greyhound to say i'll get involved be quick to get to get involved be quick to serve be be quick like the greyhound to stand up for your faith be quick to to uh to be a servant be quick to uh to compliment somebody when they do something good. You know what? Don't don't wait and say, oh, oh, I'll compliment them some other time or be quick to pray for somebody. Oh, I'll pray for you and then walk away. But you might not. Why don't you be quick to pray for them right then and there? And there's a lot of aspect to the Christian life where we ought to be quick too. I, I understand that there's uh, danger and hastiness in many areas of our life, even our Christian life, but there are times when we ought to be hasty. We ought to be quick to do something. You know, I'm just waiting for the Lord to lead. I'm just waiting for the Holy Spirit to lead. And it can create an idleness in you. It can create an atmosphere where idle hands is the devil's playground. I mean, the devil... If, if if you're not going to do anything 
he'll he'll better enter a person like that. He'll better manipulate a person like that. But if you keep yourself busy, the devil stays far away from I, I believe from busy people. But he wants. I'm trying to remember the word. Uh, there's a certain word that that describes a person that's not doing anything. That that uh, I can't remember the word. A greyhound. So we we need to be quick at times. We, in, in order to do that, we need to lay aside every weight. Some of us we need to lay aside the 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 fat that's on us. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself too. You know what? We ought to we ought to be healthy. If you want to run this race, if you if you're overweight, you're you're not going to last long. People that are overweight don't live as long. Do you want to meet God prematurely and God say, "I had this for you. I had this design for your life, but you couldn't say no." to the pizza you couldn't say no to the ice cream you couldn't say no to anything you were not temperate you you created for yourself a situation that didn't have to be that way and i'm talking i'm preaching myself too because i i eat a lot of uh inflammatory foods and i'm not going to sit there and preach you need to eat vegetarian i'm not going to preach diet to you because that's dangerous and the Bible says that there's doctrines of devils if you start commanding people to abstain from meat. I've heard preachers start preaching like Old Testament to New Testament Christians as far as what they ate and then the Jews ate. And this, those were set up for the purpose of making them a distinct, uh, isolated people that were uh, not to blend in or, or go to feast with and, and, and act and be like the the Gentile people around them that didn't know God. But there is something to be said about a diet. There is something to, to, to be said about help being healthy. I get inflammation in my shoulders. I get a lot of problems with the inflammation and, and my diet is not the best. If I was wise, you know, I know we're past the portion of verses 24 through 28 talking about wisdom the wise little creatures but there's wisdom to being leaner being in better shape i remember an old lady and uh that that passed away in in suncrest and uh we called her libby lou and she lived up to be i think 107 or maybe 109 and she was just skin and bones but you know what? It's easier for the heart to pump blood when you don't have so much fat. And even worse than a lot of fat is an overabundance of muscle. It's harder for the blood to pump through your body. The heart has to work extra hard. You know, and you say, well, I don't care. Well, you're going to end up, God said, will you die before your time? You don't want to die before your time then we ought to pay some attention to being healthy, laying aside every weight. We want to be a good testimony. You know, some people, I think, they, they take things too far and they won't even listen to, like, a fat preacher or something, but that's that's going a little far. Or they'll say, well, you don't, you don't even show no temperance. Oh, look at you, you know? Like, well, you, you, you need to sometimes just shut your mouth <laughs> and don't let everything you say fly out of your mouth, you know? But a greyhound. So we want to be streamlined. We want to be quick. We want to be agile. We want to have longevity. We want to set aside every weight. We want to run this race with patience. We want to endure. We want to endure affliction. We want to endure temptation. We want to endure trials that come in our life. You want to endure, set aside every weight. And be like the greyhound. And a he-goat also a he-goat a he-goat will dominate a he-goat will ram and hit with his horns when necessary we have to also sometimes be ready and willing to to show that type of aggression when necessary as a he-goat a he-goat will not 
stand idly by. A he goat will 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 defend. I think that's more so what we're looking at, not offensive but defensive. To defend, we have to lock horns with people at times. We have to, and we also have to understand that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But sometimes we have to deal with people in the flesh that are in the flesh. But we got to be in the spirit. That's let me word it a little bit better. And with those spiritual horns, we need to defend. We need to defend our faith. We need to defend. Uh, the, the gospel, the, the, you know, that's the foundation. You know what? There's going to be a lot of people that will preach another gospel. They'll preach another Jesus. But we, we need to be quick to defend. We need to be <laughs> ready with our heads lowered, ready to uh, butt any opposition to the gospel, to the faith, to our foundation, to the word of God. And we need to be like a he go also. And a king against whom there is no rising up. Hmm. You know, there's going to be no rising up to that Jesus Christ, that king of kings and lord of lords. Once that spoil or once that portion is divided to him who is the greatest, there will be no rising up. That's why there will be peace because he brings a sword and he establishes peace after he brings that sword and he defeats the armies that are in rebellion against him and he sets up his kingdom and only those that are on uh, board with his program will enter and the nations that supported the Jews. If you bless them, God will bless you and he will bless you and let you enter into that kingdom. But if a nation will go against Israel and Armageddon, they will not enter in. And these nations will come and worship. Those that didn't even worship the God of the Bible for all these thousands of years will worship him and they will not rise up against him. But eventually there will be a rising up when Satan is let loose after that thousand years and some people will be foolish enough to force wrath if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself or if thou hast thought evil lay thine hand upon thine own mouth we need to get in the habit of that sometimes we foolishly lift ourselves up and we don't really have any business speaking and we have to know when to speak and when not to speak and sometimes if you can't refrain you ought to put your hand over your mouth surely the churning of milk Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the wringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. You you churn milk long enough, and then butter is what appears. <laughs> you wring a person's nose hard enough, and then blood will appear. So the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. You're gonna you're gonna force wrath. You're going to force wrath on that king of kings in that day after the millennial and it's going to bring strife and you're going to you're going to meet that lion and you're going to meet that he goat and you're going to meet that greyhound and 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 Christ will quickly swiftly powerfully strongly devour the adversaries once again he will put satan in the lake of fire and not even wink, not even, not even bat an eye, and it'll be that fast. And he will speak the words and destroy them and put them in the lake of fire. And we have to learn not to be people of wrath. We need to learn to be people of meekness, people of boldness, but yet wise in our in what we say, wise in who we rise up against or who we don't. We have to realize our place. You know, the Bible even says to rebuke not an elder this is talking a warning to a new testament saint you are not to just go and start rebuking everybody and 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 especially the elders when the holy spirit leads you if you ever were to say something or in correction you better do it in the spirit of meekness you better do it considering yourself but for you to 
think it your job to sit there and straighten every preacher out or straighten out your own pastor. You have to approach these things very, very carefully because God says, if thou do, if you do foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thy hand upon thy mouth. If your intentions are evil, or if your intentions is to do harm, if your intentions is to really hurt, you better shut up, better put your hand on your mouth. But if you come in the right spirit, there's room for that. I know we have a pastor that's very, very, very kind. I mean, he will he will tell you if you have some sort of problem to please express it. Please come talk to him. He's not saying yell it out in the middle of a sermon like me yelling out uh, <laughs> delusional. But he's saying, you know what, come in my office and, 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 and discuss it with me or talk with me. You know, and he's very down to earth and and that's what we need we need leadership like that and that's the way Moses was you know very meek man but I believe I believe Moses was approachable for the most part maybe a little unapproachable after he got that brightness shining off of his face and he had to put that veil over I mean that might have been a little bit tough at that right after that to go up to him and ask him a question but we need to be approachable we need to be balanced and the Bible will bring about a balanced life to us this has been approved unto God I hope you've enjoyed it. I sure have enjoyed teaching it. And uh, there was a lot more there than I ever expected. I really thought this was going to be like a 10-minute a message or something, but uh, that's never much the case with me. Uh, this mouth, once it gets going, it's hard to stop. So we'll stop it there. God bless.